We brought a special guest. We brought some high caliber chefs in to provide the food today. We brought some fabulous wine. Uh, but before I get going with my bit, I think we need to do some housekeeping. And I want to uh, kick off this event proper. So I want to introduce the 10th, the 10th president of Grand Rapids Community College, Dr. Bill Pink, for his welcome. Thank you, Vernon. Good evening. I'm going to take this off because I just my back is just not ready for that. I want to say welcome to Grand Rapids Community College and also welcome to the very best culinary institute in the country, the Secchia Institute for Culinary Education. I think it's uh, interesting, a conversation I was having with someone earlier this week uh, here in Grand Rapids, and as we were having lunch, she mentioned how uh, this institute, how the Secchia Institute for Culinary Education is so prominent in Grand Rapids. She talked about how the various places that she goes restaurant-wise in this, in this uh, not only in this city, but in West Michigan, how many people... Uh, as uh, far as chefs are concerned and cooks at so many of the restaurants, she said, uh, almost to a person, you ask them, and they say, well, I went to the Secchia Institute, and uh, so many of them came through this very program. And so I say that because I think it's so cool that we have this gym right here in Grand Rapids and in West Michigan that prepares so many chefs uh, and so many personal chefs and so many folks who are into restaurant management and now prepares so many brewery uh, workers as well and, and uh, brewers of beer for their jobs here in West Michigan. And so we're thankful to our, to our faculty. Uh, we're thankful to our campus for this uh, Secchia Institute for Culinary Education. First of all, uh, as I give you a welcome, I also want to um, say a special welcome to, I uh, want you to welcome my wife and my daughter here tonight, uh, my wife Lori and our daughter Lydia. Please give them a little welcome there. I was told that when you're a college president, you always uh, recognize board members in the room as well as your spouse. And so that's always going to happen. I also want to uh, mention as well uh, a couple of special people we also have uh, in our place tonight. Uh, as we celebrate so often our institute here, I want to uh, say a special thank you to a, uh, a man and a woman who mean a lot to this institution, who mean a lot to the Secchia Institute, but mean a lot to GRCC, and they mean a lot to West Michigan. Um, I want to uh, have you help me in welcoming and thanking the namesake of this institute, the Secchia Institute for Culinary Education, Peter Secchia and his wife, Joan. Please stand, be recognized. <laughs> We appreciate you guys. We thank you for all you do for this institution and for West Michigan. Uh, also, as always, welcoming our uh, faculty and staff here at GRCC, uh, not only the chefs that you see in the room, Chef Schultz, uh, we have Chef Gindler, we also uh, have, uh, I think I saw Chef Charlie uh, as well. There he is, sitting behind me. There's uh, Chef Will back here. All of our chefs, all of our staff that we have, aside from Dr. Absinger, also Holly is here as well, Van Run. Uh, I please give a, a well, a well-deserved thank you to our staff here at the Secchia Institute for Culinary Education. Well, it's going to be a fun night tonight. Good partnership. Also honored to have Rick Bayless with us tonight. Uh, we're grateful for that and grateful for uh, this partnership also as seen tonight with Beacon Hill and our good friends there. And you're going to hear a lot more about partnership tonight because of the people not only sitting on this stage tonight, but also some other people in the room. So I encourage you to have a good time. I encourage you to eat because I plan to do just that. And I plan to have an enjoyable time uh, at our place tonight. Thank you. Welcome to GRCC. Thank you, Dr. Pink. <clears throat> so with that, uh, so let's get something straight. When Dr. Pink says eat, eat. So don't, don't wait for anyone to cue you to start eating. So the way that dinner is designed is that you just eat as we go along and present the, well, the speakers and everything like that. So otherwise we will be still here at midnight. So enjoy, enjoy the food, enjoy the wine, and we just do our thing up here while you're enjoying dinner. How does that sound?
Does that sound good? Very good. So having said that, I would now like to introduce Dr. Catherine Mullins. Kathy currently serves as the Vice President for College Advancement and the is the Executive Director of Grand Rapids Community College Foundation. She has more than 12 years of leadership experience in community colleges, including teaching experience at both the community college and the university level. Kathy focuses her talents on providing strategic direction and leadership to communications, public relations, grant development, and philanthropic resource development in support of other of the community college's mission. Welcome, Dr. Kathy Mullins. Thank you, Werner. This doesn't hurt my back, so I'll just leave it right there. First of all, thank you all so very much for being here tonight. Much of the work that I do in this community is to go out and raise scholarship dollars for students. Um, students in the culinary arts um, program here at GRCC, the Secchi Institute for Culinary Arts, our students are depend very much on scholarships to the point where for some of our students, a scholarship means the difference between working one job or two jobs. And um, the scholarships mean the world to them. What we do it at GRCC when we offer scholarships, in 1617, our culinary arts students received $86,000 in scholarships. Those scholarships are a direct result of the work that we do in the community and of these events like this this evening. So the fact that our students are successful in their programs is contributed directly to the meal that you're sharing with us this evening because you have contributed to that success, so we thank you very much. Now, um, let's go ahead and I just want to share some fun facts about the Secchi Institute for Culinary Education that you all may not know. You are sitting in the Secretary, Sec, Secchi Institute for Culinary Education. It's ranked as the longest, highest consecutive exemplary accredited culinary program in the country. That's quite a mouthful. Um, we have held this distinction for 35 years. We're the first and oldest culinary school in the state of Michigan, and we're the 19th in the nation. We have won numerous international gold, silver, and bronze medals in World Association of Chef Society competitions. We have 100% placement for our students in culinary and management programs. 100% of the students that complete a degree here at the Secchi Institute for Culinary Education are working. That's an awesome thing. So, as you can see, the Secchi Institute for Culinary Education is the very best place to cultivate and create the community leaders of our future, the community culinary leaders of our future. At Grand Rapids Community College, we are truly building community through food. As a result of your support tonight, you are now part of the GRCC family and have helped to contribute to both to our students and to our community. Through your support of this evening's event, we were able to raise nearly $18,000 for scholarships. This is an event that was pulled together in five weeks, and we were able to raise $18,000 for scholarships. That's an awesome thing, so thank you all very much. So, you're all on a roll now. No need to stop. We would love for you to continue your support of these amazing students in this exemplary program. You can do that by contacting our office directly, the Grand Rapids Community College Foundation, or you can simply donate online, so feel free to, to go ahead and do that. Every dollar helps, and every dollar that we raise for scholarships goes directly to students. So there's no overhead that comes out of those scholarship dollars. They go right to our students. So thank you again for coming tonight, and thank you for supporting the success of our culinary students. Thank you, Kathy, for this overview. Uh, and I think uh, it's a perfect way to segue in to introduce some of the people here in the room. But before, before I want to do so, uh, I want to ask Chef Che if he would like to speak to his course you're enjoying right now. Che, you want to quickly elaborate a little bit on it? 
I'll, I'll sit down so I'm not bending over. Okay. All the time. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. And uh, it's, it's, it's really great uh, to be here at GRCC tonight. This is just a fantastic event, and uh, we're certainly glad to be part of it. But uh, the course you're eating uh, really uh, came out of an idea that uh, myself and some of our other chefs at Brandywine Creek had with regards to really doing something a little bit more eclectic than the classic charcuterie board where we actually have a hot component as well, which is not usual. But we kind of liked the idea, so we ran with it. Uh, uh, as you saw in the note that I gave you on your program, uh, there are two different types of terrine there. Uh, one is a uh, turkey rabbit. The other one is a uh, pork and duck terrine uh, with a uh, uh, wild berry uh, plum schmear on there. Uh, so we certainly like the, the, the aspect of the fall coming into the, uh, into the season with that particular part of the dish. Uh, we also like the sope part in honor of uh, Chef Bayless. Uh, we wanted to do something a little bit more on the ethnic side. Certainly feel that uh, that uh, uh, sope really, really turned out well. We're pretty happy with all the layered flavors in there. The uh, sausage actually ha I had uh, uh, mixed specially right here in Grand Rapids from Louise Earl Bircher. So if in fact you go over to Wealthy Street, uh, tell them Chef Jay sent you and he'll continue to keep giving me discounts. So thank you for that. <laughs> Um, so we like the way that that dish, dish turned out as well. I also have, uh, from my previous life on Mackinac Island, uh, one of the fishmongers that I dealt with 30 years ago, I still deal with the next generation of, of, of uh, suppliers. And uh, we just got the first uh, harvest of uh, Mackinac Straits King Salmon, which we pan seared in a soy and sugar uh, glaze. And then uh, we actually made an aspic out of the, uh, uh, the fat belly part of the salmon itself uh, with some saffron, and that's underneath that along with the corn relish. So we're pretty happy about that part of it as well. So all in all, it's an interesting uh, dish, and uh, we hope that uh, you eat all of it and not have room for any of the other chef's food. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chef Jay. But aside of that, Chase Boss is also in the building today, and I need to make mention of that. Uh, Chuck Melicori, CEO of Creative Dining Services. Uh, where are you, Chuck? Right there, thank you. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank him and Creative Dining Services for not only helping to bring the appetizer to you, but also to literally have it served for you because most of the staff here you'll see today is creative dining wait staff. So thank you so much, Chuck. Uh, also, last minute notice, Jay said, hey, I work for Real Pool. I told the Real Pool people I'm gonna be here today. So Jay brought a brand new blender and donated it to the Secular Institute for Culinary Education. And I hear it's that brand new, they don't even have it on their website or any sales materials yet. So, thank you. I also must mention St. Julian Winery and the Bragianini Reserve labels. Nancy, would you like to speak to the wine selections a little bit for the evening? Sure, um, thank you yeah, very much for you. having us. Um, we're quite excited to be here. So Joe Borello uh, proposed St. Julian, having the opportunity to be here this evening. And of course, we took him up on that offer, saying that we wanted to provide the wine for all the courses to introduce the Braganini Reserve Collection to Grand Rapids. So most people know St. Julian for our herons or Simply Lines, which are nice, sweet, fruity wines that you can find in your local grocery retailer, but we do really nice small batch artisanal wines at the winery, and most oftentimes you either have to be a member of our wine club or come to the winery to actually taste these, but we brought them here tonight for you guys to enjoy. So uh, prior to dinner, we had our Braganini Reserve Blanc de Blanc, which is 100% Chardonnay fermented in the bottle, classic style sparkling wine. Uh, with this course, we have our 2016 Reserve Braganini, Braganini Reserve Gruner Veltliner. Gruner is an Austrian variety that is something relatively new here to Michigan growing. There are a few wineries that have very small plantings up north in the Traverse City area, and we recently planted down in southwest Michigan. And it does quite well for us. We've entered this wine in three different wine competitions, and in all three, it took gold, double gold, or best of class. And that's competing not just with wines in Michigan, but on the international level. So we were quite excited that um, we actually do know what we're doing at St. Julian, and we're making some really nice 
um, high quality wines. And I can't help but mention again that all of our grapes are grown in Southwest Michigan. So not every Michigan winery can claim that 100% of their grapes are growing right here in our backyard, but we do that. And we can say that in all of our wine labels are the Lake Michigan Shore Appalachian. So to be a real Michigan winery, we believe we have to grow those grapes right in our backyard. We know Napa makes fabulous wines. We know Walla Walla makes fabulous wines. We do know that Michigan makes fabulous wines as well. So we are really committed to working with local farmers, working with local growers to bring the best possible fruit to make the best possible wines out of those. So um, so that's that with those courses. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the Gruner. Thank you so much, Nancy. And man, Nancy mentioned briefly Choparello. I must point out that Choparello has been a longtime supporter of over many, many years of the Secchia Institute for Culinary Education. And he definitely helped us bring together uh, the GRCC Secchia Institute and St. Julian Winery. Joe, you want to stand pretty quick? So you, thank you so much. Uh, I also must thank NOCO Provisions and Chef a Adam Watts, and he can do speak to his creations you enjoyed through the VIP reception. Chef Adam? So for your uh, starters that we had in the VIP um, hour, we had a melon gazpacho uh, kind of a shooter, and we had a nice little salsa that had some pickled corn, uh, local corn. We like to use um, different farmers from around the area that we source from, and that was one of those that we're highlighting. It's end of summer, so end of summer to us means melon season, and uh, seeing some really nice uh, product coming through, as well as uh, we did a first time uh, interesting take on a potato chip that was a pork rind with pull, pulled pork on it. Um, some of them uh, got a little soggy as they sat, which was not the best thing for me to see, but uh, tasty nonetheless, hopefully, and put a little pickled red onion and cotija cheese on there. What else do we have? We just got in, we flew in some Kumamoto oysters from uh, Washington State, and highlighting stone fruits is uh, was seen on that, so we had some lovely peaches that we diced up pretty small, a little bit of dill on there. And what was the last, I'm, I'm, I'm spacing, we did four things, and I think it was, oh, the zucchini fritter. So again, end of summer, and we're on to harder, uh, hardier squashes for the fall and winter months, but we wanted to just do one last little twist on some zucchini fritters, and that's almost like a falafel uh, batter that we had, chickpea, lemon, with the green goddess. And the green goddess was made with, I think, five or six different uh, lovely green herbs that were in there. So uh, happy to be here. And I'm also a graduate of the of, uh, Sekia Institute. Um, I think 2005 was my graduating year. So been out for a while, and I'm very impressed coming back. So it's been fun. Thank you, Chef Adam. So you'll notice that there is empty seats at the community table, and that was kind of designed uh, with intent because this event is, again, about building communities. So uh, what we ask the chefs to do is as they build the, uh, the course in the kitchen, to fill the space up on the community table and come out. So in other words, by the end of the evening, we have a full community table. So symbolically speaking for building community through food. So that, just in case you're wondering why not everybody is here yet. So, but I want to thank uh, Chef Austin Gresham, who provided the salad for this evening. Um, Chef Andrew Eggert, who provided the intermezzo for this evening. J.W. Marriott Grand Rapids and Chef Keith Bryan for providing tonight's entree, and the Amrick Grand Plaza Hotel, who is providing tonight's dessert and breads. Chef Dagor will be out in a second as well. And so that's, that, that's, a, that's a summary for our in-kind sponsors. Now I want to recognize all the other sponsors briefly. Uh, our brand sponsor, Stan Chef, uh, where are you? Thank you so much, Stan Chef. 
Our silver sponsor, AHC uh, Plus Hospitality. Is there somebody in the room? Uh, they all be back in the kitchen working hard. So, uh, Ferris Coffee and Nut, Sam. So not, not only did Ferris Coffee and Nut pick up a silver sponsorship, but they also provided a coffee service for this evening. Sam, now a good time to elaborate a little bit of what were you were thinking. So we did, uh, we did two drinks uh, that'll be paired with the dessert course tonight. One is going to be a brewed coffee. We love that with dessert. Everybody loves that with dessert. Um, this coffee is going to be from Costa Rica, a little micro region in Terrazu, which is one of the growing regions there called Dota Valley. Um, cool little microclimate there. And the coffee is processed in a really unique way called a red honey. Um, it's really neat. There's two main ways to process coffee. Um, this is kind of a hybrid of the two of them. So this process basically leaves a lot of sugar on the seeds, or what we call beans. Uh, that sugar crystallizes in the sun as the coffee is drying out. Uh, it ends up nice, caramely, sweet. It'll have some red fruit character. Should go really nice with the dessert course. Um, and then, you know, in keeping with the theme of, of building community, we did a coffee cocktail as well. Um, we're kind of known for doing this in the area, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, we featured a few ingredients from uh, uh, local breweries and distilleries. So um, it's a cocktail with Founders Sumatra Mountain Brown, which is a coffee uh, imperial brown ale. Um, and we have uh, Beer Barrel Bourbon from New Holland Brewing Company. Um, a little bit of cold brew coffee as well that we did. Um, and then we did a reduction with an ingredient called cascara. Cascara is the husk or skin of a coffee cherry. And um, it, it's basically dried out in the sun. We've rehydrated it. It has a lot of sugars. So we've reduced it um, with some uh, guajillos and some cinnamon. Um, and that's in the drink as well. And a little hint of lime. So. Awesome. Hopefully Thank you so good. much, You're Sam. <laughs> now, now it's time to recognize our gold sponsor, uh, the Peter and Joan Secure family, Ambassador Secure. Thank you so much. And our title sponsor for this evening is, of course, Beacon Hill at Eastgate uh, Estates. Jeff, thank you so much. Well, we'll hear from Jeff in a little bit. He has a thing or two to say about himself and our special guest. <laughs> So I still have a couple of minutes, and so what I want to do over the next couple of minutes, I think uh, we brought all of you here, and you're supporting us in our mission. So I think it's important or vital that I actually update you on what we have accomplished over the last year and what we are going to accomplish hopefully over the next year, uh, not to put some pressure on our faculty or anything like that. But uh, so, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in a presentation. Uh, Dr. Bell was speaking, and he said that we are doing many things really, really great in education. One thing we really, really suck at is telling our own story. We never, ever tell our own story. So what I really want to do is I want to tell you a little bit about the Secure Institute for Culinary Education and give you an overview what we really do with the funds we raise through events like tonight. <clears throat> so I want to start out with competitions. So over, over the last summer, Chef Shield Renaissance was planning a competition to bring it here to Grand Rapids Community College, and he did uh, a competition for, uh, for pastry chefs specializing in chocolate and, paste and sugar work. Uh, he brought six of them then here for the coupe de Mont, uh for the 2019 competition in France. And six of our students had an opportunity to work, to work with uh, national renowned pastry chefs right here in our kitchen. So I think that's pretty cool stuff. The next thing I want to tell you about is Nations Cup. Nations Cup is coming again in October. Uh, in just a couple of weeks, it's going to happen from October 19th through the 21st. Uh, and the Nations Cup was created in 2005 in the spirit of supporting professional and cultural learning 
through tomorrow's chefs. So in other words, we bring young uh, culinarians in from different countries to compete here at Sekia Institute. The driving force behind this event are Chef Sasha Matt, who is working in the back tirelessly, Chef Audra Heckworth, right here, and of course, Director of Operations, Mike Kidder. So for the 2017 uh, competition, some of the competitions are open to the public. The banquet is open to the public. So you can come, uh, go to our website and look up the competition schedule. A competition of a different kind of nature is we, got, we are collabor collaborating with WGVU Kids Fair, a healthy recipe challenge. So the challenge is calling our kids chef chefs and grades K to six to submit the healthy original recipes. And the winners who are selected can come here right to the Sekia Institute for Culinary Education, just like the big chefs did this past summer, prepare the recipes, be judged, and uh, receive prizes for that. So that's coming up on November 4th. Again, this event is open to the public. So uh, we are working in all kinds of different arenas. The next thing, I want to elaborate on a little bit is on faculty development and promotions. Because again, uh, Dr. Pink introduced us as the number one culinary college in the country. And th that does not happen by accident. That happens by design. So again, not to put any pressure on our faculty, but through their efforts, they really put us on the map nationwide. So congratulations again to Chef Audrey Hackworth, who was promoted to professor. <laughs> congratulations to Chef Dan Gendler, who was promoted to associate professor. Dan. Ms. Holly Van Ryan, who with her team is providing all tonight's fairs, she is around here somewhere. Uh, she completed a master's degree at Ferris State University. Congratulations to Holly Van Ryan. <laughs> Chef Bob Schultz, right here he is. He received the Educator of the Year Award from the American Culinary Federation's Grand Rapids chapter. Congratulations, Chef Schultz. So the list goes on and on and on, and I promise I just pick the most important parts. Professional development uh, is a vital part to contribute to student success. Listing all of those activities would take me until tomorrow. So again, uh, know that the Sekia Institute for Culinary, Culinary Education faculty members traveled across the country this past summer to, pl to places uh, west and the East to partake in the education. For example, Chef Wilfredo Barras, are you here? Well, yeah. Well, so he traveled to San Francisco to learn from expert bakers on the craft of baking. Chef Mike Whitman, is he here? Chef Mike Whitman honed his skills in sous vide cooking from master chefs. Chef Bob Schultz honed his art in barbecuing. Chef Sasha Matt in charcuterie, Chef Luba Petros in gluten-free baking, Chef Charlie Olavsky, he is here, right? Chef Charlie traveled to learn from other education, uh, educational institutions and participated in workshops for curriculum development and delivery. And so did Chef ha uh, Miss Holly Ryan. So again, thank you faculty members for all the expertise and passion you bring to the program. Uh, the program would be only half as good without you. Thank you. And also, the success of the Sakia Institute for Culinary Education relies on adjunct faculty members, which we can't forget, and many of them are experts in the field. So again, the academic and professional accomplishments of all of our faculty members showcase their commitment to lifelong learning and helping students succeed. So thank you so much. <clears throat> and I promise I only have five minutes left because we want to go on. But like I said, telling the story, right? So the Sekia Institute for Culinary Education works in the community. So not only do we help students succeed, but the community looks to the Sekia Institute for Culinary Education faculty members to share their expertise.
I give you a couple of examples to highlight our commitment to make our community a better place to live, work, and play. Jake Brenner, Jake is here, right? Jake uh, is a full-time faculty member at our craft brewing program. And he and Amanda Harper are currently collaborating with the Grand Rapids Public Museum. So what are they doing at the Public Museum, right? The, uh, they are collaborating on a program which is called Beer Explorer Program, which is open to the public. And they allow our students to come to the museum to actually educate their guests on the beer brewing process. Uh, we are also working with the Grand Rapids Children's Museum to bring cooking classes there and cooking and science classes. And there is one more thing I want to mention, which is our collaboration, slightly bigger than all the other ones, which is uh, our collaboration with Spectrum Health and Culinary Medicine. So Spectrum Health, partnering with GRCC, Sekia Institute for Culinary Education, the Downtown Market, and, uh, and Tulane University's Goldring Center for Culinary Medicine, is building a culinary medicine program to help plant the art of cooking with the science of medicine. So the objective is to educate uh, tomorrow's physicians and healthcare providers. The offering includes medical education for residents, continuing education for healthcare professionals, and classes for community members. Culinary medicine represents an innovative and evidence-based approach to engaging, supporting our healthcare and patient communities on the importance about healthy eating and healthy lifestyles. The really cool thing is that the residency program will only start in a couple of weeks with a handful of residents from pediatrics and internal medicine. And by the end of this academic year, we have had 40 physicians come through this program, so which is pretty substantial and sizable. The other really cool program is, is that it is all funded through GRCC funds, Promise America funds, uh, thanks to Julie Parks. So one final piece, what happens to the funds we raise? So some specific aspects are raised for scholarship money, which allow our students to travel to places like Italy to com uh, compete in culinary uh, competitions. And this past spring, uh, Chef Sasha Ahmed was in Italy to compete uh, in a culinary competition, and she and two students accomplished a third place there. Uh, Chef Heckworth again, and Chef Ahmed are taking a couple of students to, or a group of students to Italy next year, again with the help of scholarship monies. Um, the internship and tuition assistant program, or ITAP, is I think a huge piece I want to educate you about. Uh, it's uh, the Internship Tuition Assistance Program, or short ITAP, is GRCC Sekia Institute for Culinary Education, and our industry partners answer to the current labor shortage and rising academic costs. How does it work? ITAP is a pilot program in initiated by the Sekia Institute for Culinary Education, the GRCC Foundation Promise for the Future Scholarship, AHC Hospitality, and Grand Rapids Downtown Market. IDAP is designed as a tuition sharing and industry work experience program during which the employer pays one third of the tuition, GRCC Foundation pays another third of the tuition, and the student play, uh, pays the last third of the tuition. For the fall 2017 uh, semester, we had two students qualify and one student was able to reduce their uh, academic bill or their tuition bill to zero thanks to other scholarships. So again, I think there's uh, really cool things happening with the money we are raising and with your support. And you are definitely helping us write our story. And the last people we need to thank today for this evening is uh, Mike Kidder, Associate Director of Operations. You won't see him out here, but he is busy in the back. Marsha Arp, who is the department secretary. Stephanie Smith, the store manager. Without those three people, that department would come to a screeching halt, at least for a small amount of time. So I want to recognize them as well. And so 
Obviously, this is not meant to be a comprehensive overview. There is much, much, much more stuff going on, but I really don't have the time, and you're all saying, shut up, we heard <laughs> enough, and I get it, I understand. But I think uh, you all need to know what we are really doing and what your support is helping us to accomplish uh, in the community. And that's what it is all about. So I hope to have given you a pretty good idea of what can happen when we begin to build community through and with food, with events like this one tonight. Cool, thing, cool things happen when people and companies like the ones you represent come together and form our advisory committees, donate their time and expertise. It allows the students, faculty, and staff of the SEC Institute for Culinary Education not only to function flawlessly, but it also helps us to make our community a better place to work, play, and live. So again, thank you everybody for your support. We appreciate it. I don't know how I did it, but I'm still on time. So thank you. Thank you for bearing with me. So with that, I would like to introduce the next part of the evening. Uh, I would like to introduce Chef Tim England. And Chef Tim England is a, also an alumni of this program. He is currently at Beacon Hill, enjoying his gig there, being more a farmer than a chef, or maybe both. <laughs> but he, he graciously uh, volunteered to be the moderator for this evening tonight. And now I would like to bring up, I promise Chef Hugley had a, had a say in this, so I would like to bring him up to introduce our special guest for the evening. Thank you again so much for bearing with me. Uh, it's great to have you all here. and. Jeff. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Jeff Hughley, President, CEO of Beacon Hill. I'd like to thank Werner for allowing us to eat uh, during your speech. <laughs> I was struck uh, by the breadth and the depth of uh, the ways in which this organization is moving through the community. Um, your initiatives are truly mind-boggling. It's a tribute to you, Dr. Pink, your leadership. Um, thank you for making a big difference in the culinary and broader community efforts of Grand Rapids and West Michigan. It's truly amazing. Thank you. I'm not sure if any of you know about Beacon Hill. Chuck, I know you do. Hi. Um, we are a senior living community. We're located on the southeast side of uh, Grand Rapids. We uh, currently serve as home to about 300 residents who live in a variety of settings, independent living, uh, assisted living, memory care, and we just built a new rehabilitation facility as well. All state-of-the-art, beautiful environments. Today is an incredible day for us as a community because we're celebrating the opening of our community house, which is a shared space um, functioning as, as an event center. The Garden Cafe uh, restaurant is situated directly in our gardens. Uh, chef England, he was touted as more farmer than chef. Uh, I'd debate that, but uh, if you look under his nails, you'll probably find more dirt than flour. So uh, there's probably some truth to this. Irrespective of that, um, it's not normal probably to build a restaurant of this sort into a garden in a senior living community, but we're not very normal. Our objective is to um, really drive an incredible quality of life for the residents who enjoy life at Beacon Hill. Uh, cuisine is a main part of that, um, but we really think that cuisine is an element of the broader mission, which is developing community. Um, our mission is to change lives, make an impact. We do so um, within the neighboring area called the Eastgate neighborhood. And uh, it's really our privilege to be able to bring resources to it um, that, that help bring wellness, vitality, and a higher quality of life to everybody there. Um, the reason that we wanted to partner with uh, Grand Rapids Community College in this endeavor today is because we think that we think similarly. Those are a lot of thinks, but that's really true. Um, 
the, the, the commitment that the college shows to developing community, finding resources and ways to leverage those resources and making life better and bringing great professionals to, the, to our field is a big deal. Uh, we want to take advantage of that, and we have, by employing those great professionals. Chef England, who is an early stage adopter of this culinary school, the Secchia Institute for Culinary Education, um, has made an enormous difference in the field already, and not just in Grand Rapids, but on a regional and national basis. Um, and we're going to continue to drive forward. Uh, it's really pleasing to see Bobby Gillum here, a recent grad of the program. Is it two years, Bobby, since you were there? Here? Great pit master and uh, a master chef on top of that. So uh, we're really happy to have as much talent as we have just right out of this program. Tonight's event featuring Rick um, is special because um, while we're talking about the ways in which we um, enhance community or at least strive to, um, this gentleman, he's made a big difference. I think there isn't a single person in this room that can say they haven't been touched in one way or another by his work. Um, having him here tonight to talk about that and share stories as you, as you ask your own questions, I think you'll find that he's not only engaging, but committed to making life better for everybody with whom he's in touch. I'm not sure if you know about his credentials, but I'll, I'll share a few of them with you. He's Bravo's top chef master. He hosts the PBS Emmy-nominated television series, Mexico, One Plate at a Time. He's written nine cookbooks. Among them are seven James Beard Award winners and also a Julia Child Award winner. Um, he's also on the New York Times bestseller list. I don't know, how many restaurants is this? Eight? Nine? Fonterra Grill, that's famous. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce that one. Joko. Tordas Frontera, Frontera Fresco, Lina Brava, Cervecera Cruz Blanca, am I close? Frontera Cochina, just to name a few. And I, I left out the longest one, I'll let you kind of figure that out. <laughs> Starts with Toplo Bampo. <laughs> really? <laughs> Toplo Bampo, everybody say that with me, Toplo Bampo. Thank you. Prost, Prost, I'm a German also. Um, I think that is an incredible accomplishment, bricks and mortar, making a difference on the culinary, in, uh, on the culinary front is an enormous task, but what I most have learned to admire about Rick is the work that he's done with his foundation, establishing the Frontera Farmer Foundation, which supports Midwestern farmers in their efforts to bring organic food, even to Chicago, I know that that's where its focus was. Um, is an enormous undertaking, and he's done it in, a, in an amazing way. And I hope somebody asks the question of how he's done that. Uh, but that is really the way in which we are aligned, I think, on an organic level. Rick has demonstrated a commitment to developing community, using his talent and the resources around him to make sure that people thrive and enjoy incredible cuisine through his gifts. Um, but most importantly, he's, he's committing not just now but into the future and doing it with action rather than just talking about it. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Chef Bayless and this esteemed panel. Thanks, everybody. Sorry, I was a little confused as to where I was going to speak from, whether it was going to be over there. I'm going to, I'm going to say a few words to you from here, and then I'll join the rest of the group up there, and we'll have a conversation that perhaps will take us into other things that you guys are interested in um, hearing me talk about and the other chefs talk about. Um, I, the one thing that I do have to say is that um, from day one in our restaurant in Frontera, just turned 30 years old this year, um, from day one, we saw our goal in the restaurant business as not just being a business. We saw our goal as creating community. And anybody that's ever worked in a restaurant will really understand this. But we, in a restaurant, we have the opportunity every single day of our lives to create community because we bring people together around a table. So just think about when you have been around a table with your family and how that time of communion around a table brings that family together. 
My grandmother used to say that as long as she was a good cook, the family would stay together because they would all come to her house and gather around the table. And once we gathered around the table, differences fell away. We saw each other as human beings. Um, it makes us more civil. Honest to God, it makes us more civil. And just also think about times when you have shared a meal with someone who you didn't know. We, we in our family, um, we have the opportunity to do this quite a bit because we have um, this home that is also our production garden for our restaurant. And um, we will auction off for different charity events a meal with my wife and I hosting a group of people that buy this at a charity thing. And it's a great way to raise money for our charity, for other people's charities. So we oftentimes have the opportunity to sit down at a table with eight other people that we have never met before and share a meal. We call it dinner with strangers. And it is truly dinner with strangers. But do you know those have been some of the most memorable meals of my life? Because we have the opportunity to get to know other human beings. And when you share food with other human beings, it really changes your relationship to them. Because let's just face it, we, none of us can live without food. And when you share the most elemental thing of your life with other human beings, you see them as vulnerable just like you, as quirky just like you. You see them as human beings that are worthy of some attention. And so we get to create in our restaurant every day the opportunity for folks to have community, whether they're seeing folks that they haven't seen for a long time that they're getting together with or family members or just friends hanging out for a while. That, to me, is one of the most precious things that we can ever share. We also get to create community in our restaurants um, because anybody that has ever worked in a restaurant knows that it's all about the orchestration of the group. If we're going to get you your food to your table, then we all have to be working front of the house, back of the house. Everybody has to be working together as a team. And we all have to do what is necessary, what we do that is the necessary cog in the wheel to keep that whole thing going. And so we create community in our restaurants because if there's discord in the restaurants, you don't get your food. If there's discord in the restaurant, the service is disjointed. If there's discord in the restaurant, the plates are dirty. So we have to create community. And to me, that's one of the greatest attractions for working in restaurants for me, because I love that sense of family that we create in the restaurant environment. And so we are creating community all the time, and we see that as a really necessary thing. Now, if you listen to popular culture, you will think about restaurant work as being demeaning work or dead-end work or not something that really contributes much to society or something that you do when you don't, can't do the thing you really want to do. But I'm here to tell all of you, and this is a great place to say this out loud, but this profession is like one of the greatest professions, and without it, there's all of that loss of community because what we do is really important to community. And if you will talk to the folks that deal in these sorts of things right now, you hear that so many people in our society feel disenfranchised. Does you, do you think that perhaps that goes hand in hand with drive through I mean that you can actually drive through and eat something in your car, and so you're never sharing any food with people. Microwave meals that you can have by yourself sitting on the couch watching the television. That's the opposite of creating community. And working in restaurants, I say, I say is one of the greatest professions that I could ever have chosen because we do continue to create community. So 
com creating community with food is right up my alley. <laughs> we have done it in many different ways, but at the heart of it is just what we do in our restaurants. We create community with our foundation in developing local agriculture. We do it. We have a scholarship program that brings kids from the Chicago public school sy system from uh, Mexican heritage um, into culinary school in Chicago and then doing apprenticeships with us and going with us on research trips to Mexico so that they can understand what the richness of Mexican culture is because most of the kids that are that re get our scholarships have never even been to Mexico in spite of the fact that most of their parents um, are first generation immigrants. So we, we are creating community in many different places, but none of it for me is as important as just sitting around the table. So here's, here's my thing. I always go out there and say this because you never know when you're gonna when when this is gonna like mean something to someone. But I always said that if the United Nations could just have all of their meetings around ten tops, sharing food on platters where they all had to eat out of the same dish, we would have so much more accord rather than discord. Thank you all. Thank you, Chef Rick. Uh, Tim, your turn. My turn. <laughs> well, this program, I was talking to some folks earlier today. The building that you set in, to give you a flashback of when my career started, my class did the groundbreaking for this building. <laughs> Literally about where the kitchen sets used to be an herb garden. And I can still remember because the robotic, they had a robotic thing out there connected to a shovel, removing the first shovel of dirt. And the culinary staff, of course, was in the tent getting chased by bees. Because <laughs> I don't think they wanted to lose their herb garden. The program for me, from the get-go, since I moved to Grand Rapids in 1984 and started the program and graduated in 1986. So since 1984, I've never not been connected to this program in one way or another. It's very near and dear to my heart and always will be. But as your life grows and your life develops and you take on different roles in your career, I'd be amiss if I didn't mention something that took place in my career today. Setting in a gazebo in that garden at Beacon Hill at Eastgate with Chef Rick Bayless in a very unscripted, actually no script interview, interaction that took place while being recorded for well over an hour that seemed like a blink. But in that time, I met a kindred spirit. There was a moment sitting there with this, this gentleman that I was seeing my reflection in my love of food, my love of farming, my love of this business, unlike anyone that I've ever met in my life. This many years in the business and to have a moment like that cross your life will never be forgotten. It will never be forgotten because when it was sitting there, we've all been interviewed, we've all been asked questions while being on film but when you're just sitting with someone that you've just met moments before, it was, I don't know how you felt, but it was as if the rest of the world was not even around. We were in that garden and it was just two culinarians unplugged, just sharing our life and sharing our story and sharing our love of this craft. If there's a word that I'll go away with today is craft and how we as culinary professionals, we never are truly done learning. We will never be done because the minute we're done, we might as well hang up our toque and hang up our white jackets. As long as we continue to learn and continue to share. The other was the topic of, we've all heard my secret recipe or this person saying this trade secret. We both came to a firm and solid agreement that there's no, no place in either one of our kitchens for someone's 
sacred or secret recipe because if they're working within our environment and they've got secrets or trade secrets that can't be duplicated by someone else within that environment, what happens if they go down? What happens if they get called away? What happens if they can no longer produce? We're only as good as the person that can succeed. My boss and my friend Jeff Hughley taught me early on, it took me a while to grasp it, but plan for succession. It's a very key note about planning for succession because if you train the people that surround you and you train those individuals to be better than you, not just as good as you, but to be better than you, that they can step in when you're not there or they can run the show when you have to be somewhere else or take care of something else, then you're doing what you should be doing. Another thing, I asked Chef Bayless today, at this point in his career, how much does he get to really cook? Yes, there is dirt under my fingernails today. <laughs> Between the, the picnic for 800 at Beacon Hill on Tuesday and the preparations for the, the luncheon today and things, my hands were in a lot of different places. But we talked about the ability to be that team leader to be that person that mentors and to share your talent with others. For me, it came out of the sheer circumstance of working in an environment during the growth of what we've been going through at Beacon Hill from the start. I look at Jeff, it's, we've not stopped for seven years. It's been constant growth, constant development, constant just a journey that's unlike no other. But for me, what came out of that was learning to cook through other people's hands. And I challenge any of the chefs that are in this business that are at a different point in their career that feel maybe a little guilty because you're not cooking as much and you're seeing it through others. If you let it happen and you realize when you let sous chefs like Bobby Gillum or my other sous chef, Maggie Teal, who's not here this evening, shine along with you and right there in front of you, the amount of gratification that comes from that is just monumental. It, life is good. I mean, it's, it really truly is. It's to have a moment like what took place today and to be able to share with the friends and the family and people that were there at Beacon Hill in that auditorium today for our inaugural food event and to have an event of that caliber and to be able to share even some history of my family. We talk about community, we talk about farms. I shared with that group today that recently in the past year, my family has done some major in-depth genealogical research on my mother's side of the family. And we discovered that we were able to take her family's history back to the year 986. Through that process, we discovered in 1746, 30 years before the American Revolution of 1776, my mother's family immigrated from Germany to England. At that time, there were so many people going to England that they could no longer take care of them. So Queen Anne commissioned 10 ships of 300 people per ship to come to the New World. One of the major prerequisites to gain passage on one of those ships was a particular occupation. That occupation was farming. Right now, my genealogy and my mother's family were 30 years away from being farmers in America for 300 years. Right. Let alone in America, they've been farming in the state of Michigan for 150 of those 300 years and my family still farms on some of the original settlement lands that they settled on over 150 years ago up in Oceana County, up along the lakeshore. I love the earth, I love farming, and I think I could speak for both of us that we definitely love peaches. <laughs> we did a lot of talk about Red Haven peaches today, and what a year it's been for peaches, but what an incredible event to be able to share from Beacon Hill. 
and to also partner with Grand Rapids Community College. And what a special, special event to be able to share it with Rick Bayless and to have him part of this, this whole community and this family as well, because this will be a day that will long last in my memory and not be forgotten. So Chef Rick, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being here and thank you for taking part in this with us today and this evening. I think they wanted us, did you want to open up to some questions yes, at this time as well? Absolutely, or, or you can start talking amongst each other about like, Rick, uh, Chef Rick had an excellent story about how he, how he encourages his staff to actually come up with new things and that's how he knows that he stays relevant. You want to share that story? Briefly, if, if, if you could. So, so we do all of our development. Our restaurants all change their menus every four weeks. So we're constantly developing new things that we're going to put on, on the menu. But um, I'm sort of the gatekeeper, the mentor in the whole process. And we all sit around a, a table and we have a topic. We're going to change the menu, say, in Frontera. Somebody that is in that actually heads the kitchen in that dining room will throw out the topic. We're going to change to, we're going to focus on the food of one region of Mexico, say. And then we start to brainstorm. And every single suggestion is a relevant suggestion. It may not make it onto the dish, but everything is relevant because it can spawn other creative thoughts. So we we have these round robin kinds of things where we're just throwing out things. And my role in all of that is to bring the depth of knowledge because I'm the one who has for 40 years been traveling through Mexico and learning from local cooks and that sort of stuff. So I can help to massage a dish that maybe a younger chef who doesn't have my experience throws out there. I can make it fit into our menu in a more relevant way. I can um, help them to understand that there are many ways to look at those flavors and encourage them to do things. And then whichever chef really sparks to the dish, I will assign that dish to that chef. And the next week he will bring a, a made dish in that sort of is the personification, if you will, of the words that we have spoken in that meeting. But my goal in all of that is to keep everybody really actively involved in the creative process, but then the, to also see through my eyes how we, we form dishes that are relevant to our menu. So that's the area that I, I, I find myself working in the most. I, I really do see myself as both muse and mentor. I'm the one that's pushing them to be more creative, perhaps, or I'm pushing them to be to be working within the confines of what our guests expect when they come to our restaurant. Thank you so much, Chef. Now, I would like to open it to the panel, and uh, maybe each of you could comment on how you are creating this environment, or if you're in creating this environment, and what you do and you go about. You know, I, I want to just... Uh, uh, tell a brief story about uh, visiting one of Chef Bayless's restaurants in Chicago. And Chuck, you were with us. This was probably five or six years ago. I'm sure you recall that. But uh, Chef Bayless came through and was uh, very diligently tasting all of the dishes that were ready to rock for that particular luncheon. And the line that I was part of were all very quiet as we watched him uh, do that magical thing. But the interesting part about that was that the staff continued to work and continued to prep and continued to fill orders as if he wasn't there. And that tells me that each one of those chefs and cooks knew that they had prepared everything correctly that day and had no worries and the, that, the, that Chef Bayless was checking on them. And that to me shows a very, very confident uh, operation in, in, in work. And, and I still, still remember that to this day. Uh, but uh, speaking to, to community, uh, uh, just for a moment, um, uh, as, we, as we think about how we're all involved with this, and, and some of us up here, as, as Tim and, and Chef Bayless have said, we've been in this 30, 40 years, um, and it goes, goes like a finger snap, uh, that's for sure. Um, but uh, as, we, as we deal with community and how we relate to 
our specific operations, how we can mentor the staff that we have to become the next generation who are going to be, be replacing us, some of us, very soon, and learning to deal with the, the community of vendors and partners that we have. And that's what we call everybody who supplies us uh, are our partners, okay? And the, the first course, if we go back to the charcuterie plate for just a moment, is we had seven different suppliers, partners, who had a piece of that dish. And all of those people are people that we deal with on a regular basis who supply our specific operation and, and partner with us every day. So I thought that was interesting as we talk about the relevance of, of being part of community and uh, having partners in this business uh, when actually seven of them part partook in one of the courses for tonight's dinner. Thanks, Jeff. I'd almost uh, like to talk about, and something that this is kind of a, a spin-off of our conversation, but I think it, uh, the, the word consistency has a lot to do with what we do and, um, you know, teaching our cooks to taste the food that they're making is sometimes a difficult thing. And I'm speaking from uh, someone that's opened a new restaurant. We've only been open a month, but uh, <laughs> consistency is something that needs to be uh, trained on and, and uh, repetition is really uh, one of those things that... Um, you know, you don't you don't know sometimes what your some of these cooks that are coming out of uh, school. They they know the steps, they know the moves, they know the equipment, they know the mise en place that they have, but sometimes they forget to taste the final dish. So anywhere from the way it's plated to the way it's served, it's like the settings of these tables. They're all the same. Every dish that's come out so far has looked identical. I think. And um, that, that comes from good training, and uh, that comes from the top down. And I think that, uh, you know, just like your, your, um, your uh, trip down to Chicago to go to Rick's restaurant, you know, that's, that's something they, they, these cooks are seeing him tasting, and they're knowing that that's something important. And that's something that I'm trying to, uh, within the last month, really um, hone hone in on for with my staff, but you know that's that's another aspect of building your community within your your restaurant itself within the four walls. Thank you. I just want to add something to that. It's a very interesting thing because um, those of you that are close into the restaurant business <clears throat> probably are aware that a lot of times the cooks never t eat a finished dish all the way through. We taste parts of it. And um, so my wife and I, part of our job is to sit down as guests in all of our restaurants every week and eat a full meal, just like regular guests there. And we require all of our, sh our chefs and sous chefs to do the same thing once a quarter. They have to come in as a guest sit down and eat the meal the whole way through. And this became very clear to me why why that enhances what we do, because we're seeing the food, at, even though we're kitchen people, we see the food from the guest perspective. When I ate in a restaurant, a very, very well-known restaurant um, a few weeks ago, um, I couldn't imagine the chef was sending us I mean, he was doing something sort of special for us, but he, but I couldn't imagine that he was sending that meal to us because it was a totally, the dishes were good, but it was totally disjointed and there was no sense of building, like you know, we talk about a meal as being like a novel, you know, you want to build to this climax and then have this sweet resolve. Okay, so you in putting the dishes together, it really it's a very important strategy that you employ. And at the end of it, um, I thanked the chef and so forth. And then the next day I had the opportunity to talk to somebody who had worked there, wasn't working there right then, and I said, Did he ever sit down in the the dining room and eat? And they said, Oh no, he not not only did he never sit down and eat, but they never saw him taste 
any of the food in a finished state. And I thought to myself, wow, okay, well, that tells me why he sent the food the way he did to our table. And so it kind of goes back to that whole thing about the table for me, that um, if you can't, as a chef, actually relate to what's going on at the table, you're probably not enhancing it in the right way. And to me, it's very important to always look at it from the perspective of the table. Thank you, Chef Rick. N Nancy? Nancy, could you, could you? <laughs> Talk about wine, right? Yeah. Wine goes with food. I mean, it's like, you know, two peas in a pod, wine. Uh, we, we love to talk about the food and wine experience. So I'm just going to touch base on a few more of these wines that we've sampled. Our Braganini Reserve Sauvignon Blanc that we had with the salad course is grown on our estate vineyard. John Braganini, our owner, is here and owner of our vineyard. And uh, very special to us in 2013 to 14, 14 to 15, we had the polar vortex that came through here to Michigan. And um, as any farmer would know, it was um, more than favorable conditions, especially for fruit growers that base their entire uh, life and their season on what Mother Nature produces for us. So you guys talk about peaches. Um, peach farmers didn't have a crop that year. And in Michigan, if you can grow peaches on a site, you can grow vinifera grapes. And when I say vinifera, I'm talking Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, all the varieties that consumers are quite familiar with. So if there was no peach harvest, um, we can almost count on there not being a grape harvest. But luckily at our estate vineyard, it's a gorgeous site, and we had maybe 5 to 10% damage at that site. So we have... We were, we were just very fortunate. But 2016 was a beautiful vintage. So Sauvignon Blanc, um, I'm a huge Sauvignon Blanc fan. I love the Marlboro region. And when we make our Sauvignon Blanc, we try to make it in that style. Of course, it's different because we're not in Marlboro. We are in Southwest Michigan. Uh, but it will have some of those similar flavor profiles. Uh, with the Intermezzo, we serve the Braganini Reserve Traminette. Traminette's parent grape is Gewürztraminer, so very floral wine, a big punch of flavor on it. Traminette, to me, is my secret sauce, although it's not secret at the winery. Um, everybody knows that a little bit of Traminette goes a long way in a lot of our different wines. So when you guys were talking about the secret sauce in culinary, uh, we, too, at St. Julian have our secret sauce internally that everybody knows of what's going on. Um, of what we do. So a uh, Traminette's beautiful. We make Traminette in several different ways. Uh, we sparkle it. We do this style. And again, it is that little drop of secret sauce in a lot of different wines. The wine you're currently drinking is our Braganini Reserve Merlot. Uh, Merlot, I mean, everybody knows Merlot. If you ever watched the movie Sideways, Merlot kind of went away because Pinot Noir came out. Uh, but we do a beautiful Merlot. It was grown by Mike Nitz and Baroda. Um, it has a lot of characteristic to it. It was age for 12 months in French oak and all Southwest Michigan fruit. So before dinner in our VIP reception, Rick was asking what he could expect from this Merlot. And I said, it's not California Merlot because we're not in California, but I definitely think it can hold up to itself and hold up to this dish that it's been paired with. And for our dessert course, we're going to have late harvest vignole. Vignole is a French American hybrid varietal. It has a really thick skin and it hangs beautifully with noble rot, botrytis. So you'll get some really nice honey notes to it, which should go beautifully with dessert. But as for community, uh, food and wine, again, they go hand in hand. When we talk about food and wine at the winery, it just goes together. When I talk about food, there's always wine that goes with it. And we have this very small network of growers. 15 years ago, when I started at St. Julian, we had 68 growers. Um, from it, over those 15 years, we've weeded it down to 13. And that's because we like to keep the strong growers. We like to keep those growers that believe in the same thing that St. Julian believes in and having top quality grapes. We want to grow for quality, not quantity. We want to distinguish this region of what we're doing down here. And so we definitely have weeded out um, those that have done farming just because maybe it was in their family or they're being shoved into it or it's something that they're not passionate about. And I can tell you that all 13 of our growers are quite passionate. They're all multi-generational farmers. And it's the bread and butter of what we do at St. Julian. And that's our community. And we consider those people our family. And so when I hear U.S. chefs talk about community, 
community. Uh, we talk about family at St. Julian. We're still a family-owned business. We're 96 years in business. It's still family-owned, and we're all about family. And I can tell you that I have been welcomed into the family as of has all of the other employees at St. Julian, and we have this great network. It extends... <laughs> Not only does that family aspect around the table with food and wine continue, but it continues to our customers. We want to create that experience for our customers. We have a large network of wine club members that we value, and when they come to our events, we call them family too, because to us, food and wine around the table is that family aspect and building into that community. And we definitely have an influence in our community and Papa. So we are a village. We're not a city. We're not a town. Papa is considered a village and St. Julian literally had the village of Papa grow up around us and we are very influential in our village. Next weekend we're actually um, hosting the Papa Wine and Harvest Festival and a huge part of the festival for us is to make donations to the community. So we work with a local school corporation that provides a tremendous portion of their funding to continue education to students in our community. Not only that, uh, John graciously started the Dave Breganini Be Nice Foundation to help um, educate students about bullying and suicide prevention and becoming a part of the community and feeling, of course, a part of family and where we live and what we do. So to St. Julian, it's not just about me personally as a winemaker, it's about my team it's about what we do and about sharing something that we are so passionate about with everybody else around that table to make to create community um, in our own community and pop out and share it of course up here with you guys in Grand Rapids and expand even regionally so um, thank you again for having us be here and um, thank you for being here we share the same thought so thank you so Now, this story gets a little bit more complicated with coffee, doesn't it, Sam? Oh, I got some thoughts. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, first, I'll just say this is, uh, I don't know if I've ever heard my thoughts and feelings and love for food and, um, and community articulated so well. So I'm sitting here trying not to geek out like, that's right, that's <laughs> right. So this is so much fun for me. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, but I, I think about maybe talking about food and community. I think uh, it's such a, a, a primal thing. This, it's, it's in our DNA to gather around food. I think back to like our, you know, when fire first came around, it's like, okay, this thing is warm. It's cold outside. Let's get around this and then maybe let's throw some of this meat on it and see what happens. So I think it's in our blood um, to, to gather around food. Um, and if you think about what it, it forces you to do, it forces you when you, when you do that um, to, to slow down. Everybody's going a million miles an hour. Um, and so when you slow down, you have time to... Um, uh, Chef Bayless talked about that aha moment with the tomato earlier at lunch. And it's like, you can have those aha moments when you slow down. Like, why is this tomato so amazing this time of year? Um, and then it causes you to go down that rabbit hole and figure out why that is. And it kind of breeds that creativity. And so we, we have to have those, allow ourselves to have those moments uh, to, to perpetuate this. Um, maybe speaking about coffee more specifically, I. I guess I just want to encourage everybody to think about uh, the coffee community both locally and globally. Um, coffee is a very interesting beverage. It's been, um, coffee is still a commodity. Um, so it's been heavily commoditized over the years, but um, there's been a big shift in the industry the past maybe 10, 20 years. Um, so consumers are demanding more traceability in their coffee. Um, they're finding out that um, coffee is very interesting flavor profiles like wine and, and craft beer. And so um, they're equating it more to that. Um, so when you start, I would encourage everybody to start going down that, that rabbit hole. It's, uh, we're kind of in our infancy in the coffee industry as far as the general population um, understanding what coffee really is or what it can be. Um, it doesn't have to just be a um, you know, smoky, kind of carbony, um, caffeinated beverage. It can be nuanced and fruity and acidic and floral and all these really cool things that you wouldn't expect from a cup of coffee. 
Um, the coffee that you're going to have this evening, I talked about it a little bit, but um, myself and a few others of us here at Ferris have, um, have been to this farm um, that this coffee comes from. We visited the mill. Um, really cool story. It's uh, a, a gentleman that has run this mill for, for about 20 years, and his four daughters are now taking over the operation, and they're running all the harvesting and milling. And so it's a really cool story. Coffee, is that's one thing about it. It's got um, stories that, that, um, that are just fantastic. And so this is going to be a nuanced coffee. It's going to, like I said, um, have a lot of red fruit character, some, some caramel notes to it. It's going to be incredibly sweet. If you're into a darker roast, you might not care for this coffee, which is okay. Um, coffee is very subjective still. We try to be objective about it when we're sourcing it and scoring it, but it is very subjective still. So if you don't like it, I understand. <laughs> but give it a shot. Um, so yeah, I would, I would encourage everybody to think about uh, coffee both locally and globally, seek, seek coffee roasters that are able to tell you those stories. Hey, this is where this coffee came from, and this is what um, you know the, the, the family is like, and this is what this terroir is like, and the varietal of the coffee tree, and all this kind of stuff. Um, because, because it's out there, and we just need people to kind of um, take a risk and try get, a, get out of their comfort zone a little bit. Um, and so the, the, the being in this community is um, it's super conducive to to that to the craft uh, craft beer you know specialty coffee. Um, so it's such a privilege to be in, in this community um, amongst um, like-minded individuals who uh, who enjoy great food community. Um, and so thank you for yeah allowing us to be a part of it. This is a this is a wonderful evening. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. So like most of the chefs, uh, I've been very blessed in my career and I, I started out in some great kitchens where the chefs would involve you in the creative process, uh, creating nightly specials and uh, coaching you along the way. And so I've taken that uh, into my personal philosophy and um, part of what I do as a personal chef, so I have, get to go into people's homes and be part of their community and celebrate with them. Um, uh, sharing things with them, demystifying kind of what a chef does right in front of them. You know, they get to sit there with me, they belly up to the bar with a glass of wine, and and I, I cook and we talk and I show them things and they say, oh, it's that easy. Well, it is, a lot of it. Um, so I've taken that and now I'm transitioning into education. So then I get to, fortunate to get to take my experiences and mentor in a different way uh, the younger chefs and kind of help steer them and, and open their eyes to what is available as far as careers out there. It's not just a restaurant chef or a country club chef. You know, there's development in many different avenues. Um, and another big part of what I get to do, I'm, I'm blessed to be our American Culinary Federation's uh, president. So part of my job is really um, taking our local chefs and immersing them back into the community um, and getting out there. Um, and we get very involved in Grand Rapids. Uh, every year we, we donate money uh, to the Secchia Institute for um, Education. <laughs> uh, we donate towards the um, culinary teams. Uh, we've donated to the Tech Center for the high school kids to further their education. Um, every year we have a huge dinner at Nodos, Old World Italian. Um, to benefit Kids Food Basket, which then goes further into the community, um, feeding thousands of kids who otherwise might not get a meal. So, you know, community starts in the kitchen with the chefs being molded, and then we can take it much, much farther. So I've been blessed to be able to do that and be the face and uh, bring our chefs and bring the community uh, together. Thank you, Chef Andrew. So, Chef Andrew Eggert, everyone, president of the American Culinary Federation Grand Rapids chapter. And the next person um, taking the microphone is Chef Keith Bryant, and he provided the entree for you. So that was probably pretty delicious. I hope there's some left. But Keith is going to be speaking also about how he builds community at the JW Marriott here in Grand Rapids. So I've been fortunate enough to come to Grand Rapids actually from the east side of the state. So 
I'm about three weeks into Grand Rapids. I haven't actually stepped foot in Grand Rapids before that, but they brought me here. Um, I'm actually super happy and excited. So there's community right there. They look, uh, looked out and brought me over here. Um, I've been able to experience the restaurant week for the first time, and that was my first week here. Uh, just seeing everyone come together and restaurant week and hearing about the dollar donation that everyone spends gets donated to Sekia uh, Institute. So I just, it's so amazing uh, just being around. I can't explain it. <laughs> uh, a little nervous, I'm not yeah. going to lie. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's, this is this is new for me uh, to be in front of everyone and talk about food and community because it is huge. Uh, food does bring you to the table. It does bring a family. And so far working out here, the family, I feel like there's a family within Grand Rapids. Everyone's communicating with each other. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have many other chefs above me to bring further knowledge my way so awesome yeah, thank you thank you so so the next person who joined us is chef austin from the uh, spring lake country club he provided the salad for you for this evening and so chef austin the question was what do you do in your professional career or at your place uh, to build community Hello, hello. Hello, uh, thank you everybody for coming. Um, and to answer the question, um, we work closely with uh, young culinarians from academies like this to uh, build, um, build a whole um, community of students and grow, you know, grow the food program here in West Michigan um, to try and make, you know, make better restaurants, make, uh, just build the industry here. There's a lot, of, a lot of potential in West Michigan for a restaurant scene. Um, also, we at the Country Club and every restaurant I've worked in West Michigan, we work with local purveyors. I'm sure all the chefs here have told you about this, but uh, work very closely with different farms. Um, every, every component on, well, 99% of the components for the salad dish were made from one five-generation family farm um, in Zeeland, Michigan. Great, great people. If you're familiar, it's Visser Farms. They go to the Grand, Grand Haven Market, to Holland Market. I'm sure you're all familiar. Grand Rapids Market. So, great family. Um, we've expanded their business. I've worked in three different restaurants in this area, <clears throat> and they've all picked them up as a, as, a per, as a purveyor. And this is expanding their business. It's a, a growing their business and giving them the opportunity to be more diverse yeah, and do uh, things like a greenhouse in the winter and provide them more income. So this definitely grows at least uh, and grows them and their family farm. So those are just two examples of what we do. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Chef Austin. Thank you. So thank you all. So we still have a couple more minutes before we open it up to questions from the audience. So I would like to pose another question to the panel and whoever feels like speaking first, go ahead and speak. There is tremendous, a tremendous amount of experience lined up in front of me. And I always wonder, maybe it's, what is one thing you wished you would have done differently? If there is such a thing, I know it's a loaded question, but what what can you learn? What can we learn from your experience and expertise? <laughs> Thanks, Tim. <laughs> For me, it's education. It's, despite the fact that I've got five years worth of college in the field, mine consists of two associates and a certificate. I don't have my bachelor's. If there's one thing for me, even at my age, I would, would have liked to have completed my bachelor's. I still, whenever I have tours that come out from the college or come out, students that come out to come and visit, I always tell them, don't stop at your associates. The amazing thing with this program being connected, not only with Grand Rapids Community College, but directly affiliated with Ferris State, it's a no-brainer. It's a win-win for those individuals to continue their, their growth and their education 
And there again, it's like I said, a cooking through other people's hands. I'm going to get that by seeing those students continue that part of it. Even with this young lady right over here that's our administrator, she's about to complete her bachelor's after getting her associates here. Works as, she's a graduate of the program. She works as our administrator at Beacon Hill at Eastgate. And at the same time, she's been going and continuing her education and is about, what are you, April, two months? End of November, is that what we're shooting? End of October, she will complete her BA. Thank you. Anyone else want to tackle that question? Jay? Well, I guess we're still on. So I think o over the years, as I've been through several different uh, organizations, different positions, um, in, the, in the earlier decades of, of culinary career for, for this gentleman, I can recall not batting an eye to work 60, 70, 80 hours a week and essentially not have a life um, because you thought that uh, you had to do that. Um, that was uh, the culture in some operations. Um, if you wanted the job, that's what was expected of you. And uh, fortunately, over the years, I was able to get out of that and be able to learn that there are other options available for, for uh, uh, qualified culinary staff. And the, the company I'm, I'm with now, Creative Dining Services, one of their core values is family. And that struck a chord 15 years ago, and it still does today, where we know that now I don't miss birthdays, and now I, I'm, a, I'm home when I need to be, um, and it makes a work-life balance uh, much, much more palatable, uh, particularly in this phase of, of my career. So I challenge those culinarians that have been through that process, uh, who cut their teeth in places that would keep you there 13, 14, 15 hours a day, uh, to uh, uh, find other opportunities because they are out there. And this is a, a wonderful market to be in for, for qualified chefs right now. There is a lot of opportunities out there. And uh, uh, I, I just encourage people to take a step back and find that work-life balance, which makes your culinary career so much more fulfilling for you to know that when you go home that uh, you still have enough energy to <laughs> have a conversation with your wife and enjoy your children. So I think uh, those first couple of decades in that particular type of atmosphere was a tough nut to swallow, um, but uh, 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 thankfully I've, I've been able to find better opportunities and they are certainly out there. Thank you, Che. And anyone else would like to tackle that question? Not really, huh? So, uh, with that, I guess we can open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Um, I just want to compliment Nancy on the wine compliments to the food. Excellent pairings. But which I knew was going to happen anyway, but the biggest surprise to me, and the one that impresses me the most, was the one that I didn't think would happen at all, and that the intermezzo with the tramonette. And what a perfect combination with that lemon and basil from the tramonette. Keep that in mind, because that's a, or with a salad with that same basil and the lemon, that tramonette was fantastic. Thank you, Joe. Anyone else have any questions for panelists? Yes, Barb. Mr. Bayless, I asked you this earlier at the reception, and I just wanted you to answer to the group. I said, when are you going to open in Las Vegas? And I was <laughs> fascinated by your response. Okay. <laughs> so my response was, there was a time in the history of the United States that all the top chefs were opening in Las Vegas. And so, of course, being 
uh, one of the movers in the chef world, I thought um, I should check into that. And I was offered a consulting job at a big hotel in Las Vegas. And I jumped on it because I thought, well, this will tell me whether or not I would like to have a place in Las Vegas. And <clears throat> very quickly, I discovered it wasn't the place for me. And the reason was I value regular customers. And in, in Las Vegas, there are just no regular customers. When you may go to Las Vegas regularly, but you don't eat in the same restaurants. So it, it's like every time that you have a guest that comes in, it's their, your one and only time to impress them. So people do crazy stuff on the plates. They do dramatic stuff on the plate. They're not doing great stuff as much as they're doing dramatic stuff. And that's just not me. So I decided decided that Las Vegas was not going to be the place for me just simply because I really value regular customers and developing a relationship with regular customers and being able to get to know them and consider them part of our, our bigger family. And I knew I couldn't get that. And so then people say to me when, when they hear me say that, they say, but you opened up at O'Hare. And O'Hare should be like the place where it's all transients, right? No, actually, most of our customers at O'Hare are regular customers. They're people who have to travel for work, and they are on a schedule. And all of the, the cooks and bartenders can tell you, oh, yeah, yeah, this is Monday morning, so we're going to see. And they could list 25 or 30 regular customers that are going to be coming through. And then the evening, the same thing, and it goes on day after day. So O'Hare has turned out to be one of our most regular customer haunts than any place else that we have. And that makes a, a big difference for me. And I'm really happy to be in that, that setting. Thank you. Yeah, sure. You are, the, you are the only good thing about O'Hare. <laughs> <laughs> You're very kind. We, we have another question here. Michael? Thank you. First of all, let's give the whole panel a uh, round of applause. As a member of the uh, Grand Rapids Community College Foundation Board, thank you very much for coming and participating in this. This is a wonderful event. I've learned a tremendous amount. I'm a Grand Rapidian, so that means I'm a born and raised in, in West Michigan. And I would like to hear from you chefs uh, a little bit about the West Michigan culture and the restaurant culture. You all come from different backgrounds, but we seem to have a very diverse restaurant community in, in Grand Rapids. And since we're talking about uh, community, can you address West Michigan in particularly and how unique or are we the same as other communities around not only Michigan, but the country? Thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> I can start. Um, and Thanks, Adam. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, so I've opened up a few restaurants around uh, West Michigan here, uh, Rustica in Kalamazoo, and then uh, Slow's Barbecue in the downtown market, which was definitely a fun-filled week after week, uh, slinging some barbecue out of there. And, uh, you know, um, just recently with NoCo Provisions and Forest Hills, uh, we, um, you know, we, we, we see uh, a little bit of, we're surrounded by Detroit and Chicago, and we, we kind of meet in the middle here. And we always are, I think, from my point of view, we're always kind of um, playing catch up a little bit with, and, and we're looking at uh, current dining trends, what's happening in the ma major metropolitan areas, what's hot in uh, San Francisco right now, might not come to Grand Rapids for a number of years. Um, and so that, that there's like a fine line there. And it's always interesting as a chef here to figure out when is the right time and when, when will we see that trend pop up here. So it's almost a, a game to me. Um, and and it's, it's happening. So when I was a student here, it was a lot longer time frame. But now I, we, we see the five year, you know, we always kind of j joke around in, in, in the Grand Rapids area, we're always five years behind, we say. Or I hear, I hear people say that. But um, I think that's coming shorter, you know, and especially with uh, 
all the efforts that are happening with new restaurants. And it takes a lot of chefs coming from maybe these major metropolitan areas coming to Grand Rapids to show us what they've got. And, and, and it challenges the diner, challenges our guests to think outside the box a little bit more. Um, and that's what we need. We need that. Uh, and, and, you know, we, I embrace every chef that's been in this area for uh, as long as they have been, um, but staying on top of trends and, and implementing them into um, our, our West Michigan world is always fun to see, and I, I encourage that and try it myself. I'm just going to jump in here, and this is not my feel to answer about this, but I will say one thing, that um, a culinary community is only going to be as good as the culinary schools in the area, that you can have some chefs that come in and open restaurants and so forth, but they'll never be able to get the staff that they need that understands what they want to help educate the diners. And it's not just an education like a book, sit down and learn this kind of education. I always call it seducing the diners with flavor, that once you get people who can understand what it is that your vision is, and it's a delicious vision, and you get the staff that can translate that into what the guests can experience. The next thing you know, all of the guests are just like, you're the Pied Piper and they're following you wherever you want to go. But that will never happen without really good culinary schools because the culinary schools provide all, or the culinary schools provide all of the, the qualified people to work in the, the kitchens. And so it, that's why it's a real honor for me to be here in this really good culinary school and to participate in this because it, it, this is the future of dining in, in the Grand Rapids area. Thank you, Chef. And anyone else on the panel would like to address the question? I anyone? think for me, with Grand Rapids, to answer your question, to go back to 84 and moving to Grand Rapids from a town of 3,000, Grand Rapids has never seemed like a, a large city to me by living in the inner city because there's all these little burbs, all these little different areas from East Town to Gaslight Village to the West Side to, and along with those different areas, there's all these different pockets of ethnicities where you can try the, the true Polish food that has its true firm roots. Some of the Mexican restaurants that are no longer here in Grand Rapids without mentioning names, but it's that, that whole thing of Grand Rapids that just, it's never been an overwhelming city. When you talk about teaching people, even, even within a place like Beacon Hill at Eastgate and in retirement community, the first number of years it was hold the sauce, hold the sauce. Well, the chefs worked hard on those sauces, they worked hard on those marinades, they worked hard on those accompaniments. I quickly made the policy, I said, it's no longer hold the sauce, put the sauce on the side whether they ask for it or not. The old phrase about curiosity, <laughs> curiosity gets the best of them in one taste. It became, for us at Beacon Hill, it became our philosophy that we then in turn redeveloped and trained those palates. They may not have ever tasted some of these things that we were doing, but through that on the side instead of hold it, we've reinvented how they eat and how they taste food. Thank you. Anyone else would like to address the question? I think we need to speak to the dessert yeah. individual down here. Mr. Doug Orr. Well, as far as dessert, um, it, it seems like um, we lag behind a little bit in some of the trends, but, uh, you know, in five years or so, but they kind of stick around a little longer as well. Um, you know, we see that the cupcake won't go away. <laughs> um, but as far as uh, Grand Rapids, I, I was born and raised in Grand Rapids, and uh, so I don't know a lot different. Um, but I, I truly... Um, love our city 
and and it's grown slowly, but very well, I think. Um, and I'm very proud of this city for the for the food for this school. I teach at the school as well, so <clears throat> it's been a place where I've grown. I, I was a student here, and um, I, now I teach here. So uh, it's certainly a sense of pride uh, that I have to work here and work in one of the most prestigious places in the city. Um, but to keep us up on dessert, you know, is a tough task. Um, and we do have niches in the society that uh, that are great, you know. Um, <laughs> as far as what's in front of you, um, we have a, uh, a lime crema, um, which uh, we serve a version of this up in Cygnus uh, with lemon. So we changed it to lime for tonight with a uh, toasted meringue. Uh, we have a mango salsa with fresh raspberries. So certainly hope you enjoyed that tonight. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we have a question here from Latara. Yes, perfect. Um, thank you. Oh, my goodness. So the meal was amazing, everything complimentary. And I feel bad because my question is such a basic one. But Chef Bagelis, I want to thank you for your time and everyone who had a hand in the meal tonight. Everything was awesome, complimentary. But my question is for Sam. Sam. Is this coffee available for purchase? Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, come to Paris. I'll be there. Bye. Thank, Thank you. We have another question here. Well, not so much a question as just a comment. Uh, Chef Bayless, you won't remember me from Adam, but I walked in your restaurant during uh, the National Restaurant Show, uh, 15, maybe 20 years ago, you were at the host stand, and you greeted me like we were long-lost buddies. I don't know if, if you do that with everybody or what, but it was an epitome as a chef coming in and an owner of a restaurant myself. It just hit me to the core that you could offer hospitality. I was one of the lucky ones that had a reservation at Topola Bampo during restaurant, uh, inter, you know, the National Restaurant Week. But you were amazingly gracious. You handled the stress. And you had every bit of the epitome of a front of the house maitre d' as a chef. And because I now teach front of the house, that is just such a core situation that I can explain that is so important that chefs understand how to do that and relate to the front of the house. So thank you. That is inspiring. Number two is Chef England. You talk about letting go and being that suit and tie chef. And as a restaurant owner and corporate chef at Steelcase, that is hard to do. And I thank you for reinforcing that idea and understanding that as chefs, as we evolve, that we need to be able to push the next generation, not keep those secrets, and make sure that, that they are just adhering to our standards and we can let go. So to both of you, thank you very much for the inspiration. I appreciate it and use it every day in my teachings. Thanks, Stan. Any, anyone you want to reply to that? Chef Bayless, Chef Tim? Um, I, I will just make a quick comment on, to, on that, that one. Um, I, I believe very strongly that uh, we are, that hospitality starts at, in our restaurant at the back door and it moves forward. The back door is where our dish station is, our prep kitchen is. Then we got the lines where all the food is finished and sent out to the, the dining room. And I have always had no walls between the dining room and the kitchen because I wanted to make sure that everyone in the kitchen understood that hospitality starts all the way at the back and moves forward. And as we say in our restaurants, that, um, that if we're not hospitable to one another, those of us that work together in the kitchen, in the front of the house, if we're not hospitable to one another, we can't expect hospitality for our guests. So hospitality for us starts at the back 
And first and foremost is the way that we treat each other as, as employees in the restaurant. And then that translates directly. And I can say it is a direct translation. <laughs> I have seen it happen so many times in a pre-shift meeting where <clears throat> we're talking about who knows what, but um, somebody helps another person to understand more fully something that's on the plate that they just didn't get. And the next thing you know, that person is explaining that to a guest in a way that is, that is transcendent. And to me, that's really, really important to, that if we're nice to each other, then we're all going to be nice to our guests. <laughs> it kind of boils down to that. And so, <laughs> yes, we should applaud that. It's a, it's a basic kind of thing, but I think it really means something. And so um, that's the way. And I also believe that it all comes from the top. However, my wife and I are living our lives in the restaurant is exactly the way that everyone else in our restaurant will live their lives. And somebody will say, oh, but there's this one bad apple over there. Yeah, that was the bad apple. We'll get rid of that person. And then we'll go on living our lives the way that we want to. But thank you for bringing that up. I don't remember a thing about it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's good. It's good. That just means it was natural for me. So thank you very much for bringing that up. Thank you, Chef. We have time for one more question. Erna, just one quick. Yeah. That part of letting go, you're going to get put on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> My career at Beacon Hill started just seven years ago this October. And during that seven years, if it wasn't for this man sitting directly across from me that you met earlier, Jeff Hughley, I wouldn't be the man that I've become today. He's taught me the importance of letting go, shutting the layers off your shoulders, changing yourself, redeveloping yourself, reinventing yourself. I shared with Rick Bayless earlier today, we've all heard the phrase glass ceiling. At Beacon Hill, our mantra is, what's above that glass ceiling that you just broke through? The answer to that question is the next floor. You break through that glass ceiling, you find the new floor, and you aim for the next ceiling. That's how we continue to grow. That's how we continue to develop. That's how we continue to succeed. If it wasn't for this man sitting across from me, I wouldn't be the new person and the new chef that you see that I'm able to share and be able to be involved in this community the way that I am today, from the advisory board at this school to the advisory committee at KCTC, on and on if it wasn't for you, Jeff Hughley. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Chef Rick, you have any parting words for us, so to speak, before we wrap it up? <laughs> My only parting words, uh, because nothing would be more beautiful than that, is just to say what a pleasure it's been to be here with all of you. Um, I, I thank uh, both Beacon Hill and the Secchia Institute for uh, the invitation to share this. It's, I, I can only say I've gotten so much more out of this experience than I probably attribute or gave to it. Um, but it's been just a joy to be here with everybody and to share. And I'm a huge believer in education. And uh, any time that I have a chance to be in an educational institution, especially one as great as this one, um, it is always such a joy and an honor to do that. So um, keep up the great work, I will say. And I hope that I see you all again really soon. Well, to wrap things up, we want to say thank you again to all of you for being here tonight. A special thank you also to, again, as Vernon mentioned earlier, all of our sponsors who are here tonight from the Secchia family to all of our uh, companies and, and those individuals who mean a lot to us in terms of uh, this event. We thank you for that. Uh, we thank, uh, I'm looking at the panel, Sam, uh, I want you guys to help me thank Sam uh, with Ferris Coffee, thank you so much for those coffees. They were very good. Did you, you agree with that? <laughs> Nancy uh, from St. Julian, thank you guys so much. Mr. John, thank you so much for your contribution. We appreciate it. Thank you for that. And to all our chefs, please, what a meal tonight.
before you leave, uh, can we have uh, Chef Bayless come over, please? You can't come to Grand Rapids Community College and not leave with some swag. Okay. Chef Bayless, I want to say to you, um, before uh, my family and I came to Grand Rapids two and a half years ago, we, I spent the last 20 years in Oklahoma City. And knowing that that's your home, I thought, you know, we got, I got to share a little bit of that, see if you're more Boomer Sooner or Go Pokes. Are you, which one? You're a Boomer, okay, gotcha. Uh, that's all Oklahoma stuff, can't tell you. But I want, there you go. <laughs> we want on behalf of our foundation and on behalf of uh, not only the president's office, but Grand Rapids Community College, the Secchia Institute, and all of us here, we're honored that you've been spending this, this day here in Grand Rapids, both at Beacon Hill and here at our campus. We're honored for that. We thank you for your time. We hope that you come back, see us again. And uh, remember, in your travels and in all your work, this Secchia Institute for Culinary Education not only is the best in the country, but we're a fan of yours. Thank you. So thank, thank you so you. much. Pleasure. Thank you so much.